Um, but when you get to graduate school, you're trying to pick what project you work on. You can't relate that to an equation. When you're, when you're given something brand new, some issue, maybe, maybe it has to do with, with nuclear weapons, maybe it has to do with, uh, with, with, with global warming, something like that. When you're confronted with something like that, you can't reduce it to a simple equation. In fact, I've found, and many of my fellow professors have found, that, when, that one of the things you have to do with a graduate student is beat the math out of it. Start thinking physics. Stop trying to think mathematically. It's more important to know whether that equation is the right one than it is to know how to solve that equation. So how much physics is separate from math? Well, numbers are important. When I teach these qualitative, what, what you put in qualitative physics, it's not qualitative, it's quantitative. What I don't do is ask them to solve three variables or three unknowns. So it is important to have numbers. And one of the things I've discovered when I made this transition from teaching physics majors to teaching the, the physics folks was they don't mind memorizing. I'll give some examples of that in my talk. And they don't mind big numbers. Now, some students have trouble with this. But every future businessman, every future world leader has to be able to cope with big numbers. It doesn't mean they have to, it doesn't, I have a fellow faculty member at, 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 uh, at Cal, and he told me once, it's absolutely true, I believe this completely, he was just relating. He says, when he wants to relax, what he does is he pulls out an integral table, finds some integral that he's never worked out before, sits down with pencil and paper and derives it. This is where he likes it. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there are people who love math. Uh, people who don't do integrals for fun still do important things. And they're happy to cope with big numbers. And you have to work with numbers. I don't teach qualitative physics. I teach quantitative physics. But I emphasize the physics and de-emphasize the math. Now, when a student, we get some math majors coming in. They're frustrated. So what I started doing is this. I'd say, OK, now let's start. I'm going to talk a little bit about the limit of how much energy you can pull out when you've heated water up to 1,000 degrees. And at this point, I'm starting three minutes not required. We're going to do some math. If you want to take a break, go on Twitter, whatever, it's OK. I'll come back in three minutes. And then I start working on how to math. What I find is that the math students are happy because we're doing the advanced math, which they wanted to see. The non-math students are happy because they're not required to know it. But they don't go twittering. They want to watch. Because it's not required, it's not stressful. And so they actually wind up learning more than you would have guessed. Because in fact, I said, this is not, I do this part of it, not required stuff. What's important for the physicist to know? For the, the future president. When I started taking this course, I, I originally I called it Physics for Future Congressmen, and I decided it came higher. And part of it was inspired by the fact that I see so many things going wrong back then, and continuing now, of our world leaders. I'm, I'm getting, because of the work I'm doing at Global Warming, I've been taking a lot of trips to Washington. And there is so much confusion there. Is that because they don't know how to do integrals? No. The, the, the physics they don't know is much more fundamental than that. Uh, and so I try to find those things that, there are two things you try to do, of course. It, 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 everybody knows that, that teaching is not filling the bucket, it's lighting the fire. And so what you want to do with the students is to get them to recognize the fact that yes, they can learn physics. You take one semester course, two semester course, and if that's the end of it, it goes away. But if they keep on learning the physics, if they realize they can learn this stuff, if they realize, I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples. But, but, you know, what is, it, what is important for your, for your future president to know? Is it important to know that when you have a roller coaster at the top and it slides down to the bottom, you can neglect friction, figure out how fast it's going, just from the height and conservation of energy? Is that what you need your future president to know? Or do you want the future president to know the effects of a nuclear bomb. That's also a nuclear bomb. That's a typical US weapon carried in our B-52s. That's the bomb that was exploded by the North Koreans. Can you see the little red dot there? 
This is quantity. You need to know the difference between a big hydrogen bomb and a small hydrogen bomb and know the difference. And one of the things that distresses me is I see in our dialogue around the world now is that we, we see them as the same. Yeah, that's lumped together with the previous one. And it's worthwhile knowing the numbers. I don't know what conclusion you're going to draw from this. That having a small nuke is going to lead us into a large nuke, which can lead to Armageddon. Or they're going to conclude, why are we making such a big deal about a little bomb? Well, I don't know what your conclusion is going to be. It might be either of those or something else. But I want people to start with the same basis. And a little warning. I don't care if you are a denier of global warming or if you are an alarmist of global warming or anywhere in between. To the extent that this stuff is science, we can agree on the science. I sometimes define science as that narrow, small little bit of knowledge on which there's universal agreement, or at least there will be, even if not now, because it's not settled down, that in the future everybody will say, yeah, that was true. I mean, that doesn't happen in politics, it doesn't happen in even history. We can't agree on what's, you know, what, what really happened in history. Uh, history is completely being rewritten, it seems, every few years. My children saw a advertisement for a program that was going to tell the other side of the story of Christopher Columbus. So they went to watch it. They were really eager to see this. They wanted to be on the other side. They were only one side. And so they turned on the program, and they started talking about what a bad guy Columbus was. Like, no, that's we're the same side. I want to hit the other side. <laughs> and they knew that Columbus had been honored for centuries, and now he was just a bad guy. They wanted to hit the other side. They, they, they couldn't find that. Anyway, there are often two sides of these things. And you can't agree on history, but you can agree on physics. So my goal, when it, it, it wasn't, it's, I didn't know what I was doing right away, but and it took me a while, and I warned my students, by the way, the first few years. I say, if you want a really well-organized class, I'll put it off for a few years, come back and take it your senior year or something, because I don't know what I'm doing. And I fumbled around, and I tried teaching conservation of energy in the first, first few weeks. It's really tough. And the people came to my office happens. And I said, why are they having such a hard time? It's just potential energy turned into kinetic energy. What's so hard about that? So I started looking back at how we teach it to the physics reader. And I was surprised to realize that teaching energy takes 40 years for the student to understand. It's tough. We define it as, and what is energy? It is the ability to do work. So what is work? Well, if you hold 100 pounds and walk horizontally a mile, you have done no work. <laughs> So how can they understand energy when they don't understand work? And besides, what do we mean by ability? Do I have the ability to exercise because I can go and eat some food and then exercise? You know, these things, the ability to work, I think, is one of the most, it's, it's only good if you ignore it. Memorize it, write it down on the exam, and then forget it completely. The way you learn energy is by using it, by immersion. And so my whole class was based on immersion. Um, okay, it reminds me of when I walked into a class one time, and the teacher there started, was in high school, started talking to me in Spanish. So I, am I in the right class? I haven't studied any Spanish whatsoever. What am I doing here? Uh, and he kept on talking, and he was moving and doing things like this, and saying things. And I kind of realized I knew what he was talking about. And I began to pick it up without doing a word of translation. And that's what I started doing in physics. So we jumped right into energy. In fact, the first week of my class, I remember this, it was in 2001. First week, we talked about nuclear bombs and the energy released, the energy of batteries, the energy of gasoline. Here's a, a fascinating little fact that I taught that week. I said, if you take one pound of gasoline and one pound of TNT, the gasoline, of course, combines with air, so it's cheating a little bit. But you take one pound of each, how much energy, how much more energy is in the TNT than the gasoline? 